Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. I have on the show today two special guests. I know I rarely do two guests at the same time. And as you will hear, uh, having two guests at the same time did present a few challenges uh, to the internet connection. There's a lot of data coming through, but we worked out most of the kinks, so you should be able to get um, 98% of what we talked about. It was such an invigorating conversation about immigration, about uh, asylum seekers, uh, about the 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 deep chasm that exists between the narratives being retold on mainstream news outlets and actually what's happening on the ground around the border between America and Mexico. This was a fascinating conversation. You're going to be challenged. You're going to hear stuff you probably never even thought about before. And I'm excited for you to engage this conversation. I'm, I'm still just uh, <laughs> reeling from uh, our our scintillating talk that we had. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Pohays is Assistant Professor of Christian Scriptures at, Baylor, at, at Truett Seminary, which is part of Baylor University. She has a PhD from Baylor University, and that's where she teaches teaches uh, Biblical Hebrew Old Testament and the Psalms. She's also the author of the recently released academic book called uh, The Function of Story in the Hebrew Psalter. John Garland is the pastor of San Antonio of the San Antonio Mennonite Church and chaplain of the Interfaith Welcome Coalition. He became a pastor of this church in 2016 during an immigration crisis that uh, has dramatically shaped the church and its ministry. Uh, John's currently doing doctoral work on a on communal trauma, spiritual resilience, and the Psalms, which is a lot of what we talk about in this conversation. So um, I'm excited for you to engage it. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm excited for you to, to hear their perspective on what's going on down at the border. If you would like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw, support the show for as little as five bucks a month. Also save the date next spring. Um, March 31st through April 2nd is the first ever Theology in the Raw conference here in Boise, Idaho. Um, the information is coming very, very soon. We've got loads of amazing speakers that are lined up, including Jackie Hill Perry, John Tyson, Thabiti Anubwale, um, Derwin Gray, Sandy Richter, and many, many others who are going to be at the Theology in the Raw conference. would love to see you there. It's going to be live streamed, uh, but I would also encourage you, if at all possible, to come join us live here in Boise next spring. Also, a few other events on the faith, sexuality, and gender conversation. October 7th, I'll be in Texas, Plano, Texas, at the Revoice pre-conference talking about uh, the transgender conversation. Uh, then October 20th and 21st, here in Boise, we have a faith, sexuality, and gender conference. All the information on those events, or at least the last three that I just mentioned, are at this, uh, are on centerforfaith.com forward slash events. You can check out all the information and find out how to register. Okay, without further ado, let's get to know uh, Dr. Poe Hayes and Pastor Garland. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. I'm here with uh, two uh, new friends of mine, uh, uh, Rebecca Pohays, a uh, professor at Baylor University, and uh, Pastor John Garland, a pastor of a Mennonite church in San Antonio. So thank you both for being on the show. I think this is the first time I've had like two people Skyping in at the same time. So uh, hopefully this doesn't destroy my internet as there's so much uh, <laughs> data coming through my um my Idaho system here, which is pretty, pretty, uh, backwoods and needs to be updated. But anyway, thanks so much for being on the theology and raw. Thanks. Glad so to be here. Why don't we start? Uh, uh yeah, Rebecca, tell us just a brief snapshot of who you are and, uh, the, the general category that we're talking about is immigration. And, and I know John's got a lot of hands on kind of work that he's doing right now, but how, who are you, Rebecca? And how'd you get interested in this, uh, topic? Yeah, so I teach at the at Truett Seminary, which is the seminary at, at Baylor University. So it's a, a Baptist seminary, um, but we have a Wesley House, and you know, it's it's a, a nice sort of diverse place. Um, and I uh, I come out of ba the Baptist world, so both of my parents are Baptist pastors. Um, and my mom is a social worker as well, and so always these kinds of um, justice issues and, and loving our neighbor uh, has very much been part of um, my whole upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, and as I felt called to ministry and called to ultimately um, called to, to equip others for mm -hmm. ministry here is, uh, at Truett, um, 
these questions have continued to to really be at the heart of of the kind of work that I want to do. Okay. Um, and so I, I don't really write on immigration right. um, exactly, right. but I have um, sort of through a, a chain of events, I've I've gotten into where I'm I'm doing a lot of work on. Um, on trauma um, and on resilience and how um, scripture, um, the scripture that God has given us um, provides Mm -hmm. um, tremendous resources for both trauma healing and resilience building. Mm -hmm. Um, And my major area of focus is the Psalms. And Mm -hmm. so I've been working um, a lot with that. So you're an Old Testament scholar, right? Like that's your specialty. You teach Hebrew and everything. Yeah. I'm an Old Testament. Yeah. Old Testament Hebrew Bible. um, And my, my, initial sort of research area was on and still is because I, I sort of see them I see them very related um, was on story and storytelling huh. and, and poetry um, in the Psalms um, and, and seeing what you know why did why tell the stories these ways right or huh. why tell a story here um, in the Psalms which tend to be sort of non-narrative kind of things mm-hmm. but stories pop up yeah. um, and so why why are they popping up where they do and how does that help? And that's, that's sort of, that's actually what set me on this, um, journey towards trauma studies because, um, trauma and narrative are actually really, or the lack of narrative are actually really closely related. Uh, Do do you have a favorite Psalm? No, I mean, it depends on what I love to ask that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's, you know, that's one of the things that I love about the Psalms, right, is that they are all so different. Yeah. I tell my students, you know, that for a long time I didn't like the Psalms because huh. I sort of had this notion that, you know, they're all the same and it's all a bunch of hallelujahs, praise the Lord, <laughs> you know, and they get really boring. Um, but they're really not. I mean, they're yeah. really radically different and they fit every aspect of our experience. Uh-huh. Um, and there's so much there. And, you know, no matter how many times you read them, um, they speak to you in different ways. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I, I've, I'm really attached to Psalm 107 right now. Um, really? So that's the one. So it's got all these different um, short little stories, right? Little vignettes, yeah. little, little parables um, that get woven together into this larger narrative about what the life of faith is. Is that the so. one that's connected to Psalm 108, Psalm 107, 108? Do they kind of go together or am I thinking of something else? Maybe that's a different. Uh, well, Psalm 106 and 107 oh, okay. get paired a lot together sometimes, but okay. they're all, I mean, that's part of what John and I've, I've worked on is they're all sort of connected, yeah. right? They weren't just all thrown together randomly. They're arranged. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, when I first got saved, uh, Psalm 63 was a big one for me. Um, then I did a research paper on, uh, Psalm 110 and not only is the Hebrew of that pretty disastrous or just difficult, but it's a powerful Psalm and obviously a favorite <laughs> among New Testament writers, Psalm two, right. Psalm 16. Yeah. yeah. 63 anyway. was really important for me when I was in college. That was sort of like yeah. my Psalm that, that yeah. got me through a lot. So good. <laughs> Well, John, uh, tell us about yourself. Uh, you're a pastor down in San Antonio and, and of the of a Mennonite church. Is that right? Yeah, I'm, we're we're right in the middle of downtown San Antonio. San Antonio is uh, in the middle of the immigration routes, um, and uh, we're surrounded by immigration prisons. Uh, um, mm-hmm. And we, about seven years, um, our church got caught up in this immigration crisis, and it has dramatically shaped um, our church. We run a hospitality, you know, in our backyard. So we've been hosting in our hospitality house, maybe eight bedrooms, um, and in our own homes, uh, thousands and thousands of asylum seekers over wow. these last wow. uh, seven years. And it has dramatically shaped our church um, because we've been, you know, hearing not just providing, you know, a safe place to eat and rest, but um, but also hearing the stories from Central America and from Haiti and from Central Africa um, as wow. People are fleeing, um, you know, horrors and and horrific trauma. And what happened is Sunday, um, after hearing these stories, and folks wanted to pray with us um, and and share, and they wanted to sing, and they wanted to come into our church and worship with us. And so we've had to um, multiply the languages that we're we're worshiping in. But we, there's this astounding moment. We walk in after a really hard week, um, and you. You, you step into the sanctuary and you see up at the front of the church is this cross. And you 
suddenly realized, I remember this moment, I was like, oh my gosh, we have in the middle of our church a, a public lynching tool. Wow. And it's wow. it's been used for uh, to traumatize communities. And we have it up in the middle of our church as a symbol of God's victory. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and God is transforming this communal trauma. And there's a sudden realization years ago is like what we're participating in is, is a is a faith movement that transforms trauma. This is what Christianity is, is like tr- mm-hmm. trauma transforming movement of of faith. And then and then, then I realized to join our church. One of the things you have to do is you have to practice drowning. You have to you have to say okay to someone like holding you underwater and going into death and dying in the water and then coming up in a new life and the symbol of the symbol of God transforming the trap and God transforming the the drowning and the deep uh, wow. into a place wow. of of becoming part of family um, and then how do you live into that as church leadership and how do you live into that as a church family and then and then you know we now do it every Sunday at our church but we'll go up front at the end of worship service and we take uh, what is supposed to be a body and we rip it apart and then we we pretend to pour blood all over the place and then we tell people to come up and eat it um, and drink of it it's this horrific image of that is so similar to the stories that we're hearing from our asylum-seeking brothers and sisters mm. who are telling of the horrors of their lives being ripped apart, actually seeing um, horrible deaths um, mm. and murder um, and uh, and holding that in their hearts and then being invited up to the front of the church with one another to participate in God saying, I'm transforming even this horrific trauma into communion. Mm-hmm. Be one with you and y'all being one with one another. Mm-hmm. This, it's an astounding and audacious symbology that yeah. we have of trauma transformation. And so as a pastor, we have been um, uh, we've been pushing ourselves and, and listening and walking in this sort of trans, tra- trauma transforming movement. What does it mean to actually take these symbols, these rituals, um, and then these scriptures seriously. So we turned up, you know, teachers like Dr. Poe Hayes and, and as, a, as a counselor uh, to bring us back into uh, reading scripture from these eyes of uh, God is really serious about hearing and seeing and bearing witness to our trauma and then inviting us into transformation. Um, and how, how are we going to do that as a church um, in such a, a time as this? Wow. And I've really, I mean, you know, I said John was, John was in my class, or I can't remember if I said that or not, but, but that was one of the things, I mean, this perspective is one that so many Christians in the West and the, the privileged, um, white Anglo West anyway, uh, we forget this side of our faith mm-hmm. and we forget, um, the context out of which our scripture emerged right and we read it from a position of power we read it from position of privilege Mm -hmm. and we forget how um traumatic so much of Mm -hmm. this is and so we we lose i think some of the joy um so i really appreciated learning from john and and watching the other students in the class get to learn from john and from the stories Mm -hmm. that that he has brought um, and shared uh real quick just for our audience that the if if there's some glitchiness, we're gonna try and clean it up. Hopefully, we can clean most of it up. But uh, I apologize. There's the 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 bandwidth here is getting getting stressed out a little bit. But um, I hope you can get the the bulk of what they're talking about because this is so this is so important. I mean, um, both of you are saying. I mean, it's almost like we've really sanitized our liturgies as a church, um, and we've had the privilege to do so. What one of my one of my favorite books that kind of blew me away read a few years ago is uh james cone uh, the cross and the lynching tree where um where these you know the the lynchings that were very wa- very widespread very public i mean it's so disturbing to read the his- the history of the lynchings in the early 20th century especially um but how the 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 black community understood they had they had a symbol <laughs> the cross through which they were able to kind of almost make sense um of what was going on and even have this horrific yet very real identity with Jesus in a way that the majority didn't have. Um, and, and it sounds like very, something very similar that, that these, the, we have these available symbols and rhythms in Christianity that are right there that we've kind of ignored that 
that make more sense to somebody like an asylum seeker than than people on the other side of the fence. Um, I'm I'm curious, John. I know I I ask you this offline, but you know, obviously, when once you mention immigration and asylum and undocumented immigrants and the border crisis and walls and all this stuff, we're we're obviously tapping into some volatile political conversations. How much of what we see or hear on the news is actually is that how much of that is accurately portraying what's actually going on? Cause you're in the, what's going on. You're right there. You're there. Um, when you watch the news, how much of that does that accurately portray what's, what's going on on the ground? Well, I'll say I'm often interviewed by the press. Uh, they'll call me for particular stories and almost every time they call me, they ask me to provide them with the story that they're going to tell. They say, could you, uh, put me in contact with a mother who, and they'll tick off the things that they want to tell. Um, or, or alternatively, um, if they're coming from a different, so they, they've already telling the story. So you're going to, you, you can believe about, about five to 10% of what you're <laughs> hearing sort of prefabricated, um, I think, uh, narratives. Um, but really what is going on, I think is, is a story of the church, um, in this immigration crisis. This is, uh, these are Christians, brothers and sisters and, and, and 85% of them over these last seven years that we received are evangelical Christians. 85% um, all, of asylum seekers. Yeah. And that's us counting and, and the, the number of the folks that they, the way that they pray, uh, the way that they sing, they have this, they're singing the same songs as we are. Um, they, their, their favorite Psalm sorry, by scripture, they pray with one another, uh, every evening at our hospitality house, we're, we're gathered in prayer, um, uh, together. We're talking, this is a story. It's not a, it's not a political story, really that that's happening on the news. Yeah. The story is, it's a story of the pilgrim church, um, and how, uh, we as a, as a church in America are receiving the pilgrim church are the persecuted, uh, pilgrim church. Um, I spent a lot of time also in Central America with some of the churches there watching their leaders being driven out um, by the violence, by the persecution. Um, and at, we're receiving pastors and we're receiving social workers and community leaders um, and folks who def- desperately want to um, want to pray and worship hmm. and heal. Um, and and it's a huge gift. Uh, it's a huge gift. That's a difficult story to tell uh, because it doesn't fit into any of the, the prescribed political narratives that you're generally going to get from the from the news. Um, Do you get frustrated when when Christians try to make sense of the the quote unquote border crisis through the lens of their favorite news channel? Is that hard to hear? <laughs> No, I mean, we do that with everything. It's not so frustrating as, as just predictable. Um, there's really three questions that people are always asking me over and over and over again, and they're three fear-based questions. The first question is, um, it's like a legal question, like, are you breaking the law? Are you, uh, like, are, is this legal? Are they actually Christians if they break the law? Um, and, and so wonderful reflections on legality and the law in the New Testament that, that lends itself to a lot of, I think, spiritual growth. The second question is always about resources. Um, why don't they take care of themselves? Why don't they fix their own problem? Why should we help them? Uh, why should we have to pay for all of this? Uh, it's a basic fear of like uh, uh, um, uh, fear of limitations. Um, and it's that, that, that general fear fear question. And, and of course, we've been giving these marvelous multiplication stories um, and Jesus loving us being in that place of limitation um, and dependence on, on God. So that that question, that fear based question lends itself to, I think, a lot of spiritual growth, too. Um, and then the last question is always a change question, a fear of change. Is this going to change our economy? Is it going to change our culture? Is it going to change our food? Is it going to change our health system? Is it going to change our whatever? Because I feel like I'm doing pretty well now and I don't want change. Um, and is going to change the way we worship <laughs> is going to change the way we read scripture, heaven forbid. Huh. Um, and, and the, these, this change question also lends itself to a lot of spiritual growth. Jesus loves change and demands change. Um, and so that those, those fear, when you see sort of the root of the questions, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm afraid that this is not legal. I'm afraid that we don't have enough resources. I'm afraid that we're going to change. Mm-hmm. Um, you can just say, well, hallelujah. <laughs> this is this well, seems sounds like kingdom of God uh, place. Like you said, I mean, the, the the second two questions do not. I want to be really careful. I I don't want to overstate my observation, but they don't reflect a Christian worldview. I mean, I I want to I want to meet people where that and appreciate 
where their difficulties are, but the the way you worded the second third question, it's like I almost want to say, well, what are Christians asking? Because those aren't Christian questions. <laughs> like, well, how come we have to take care of the other? How come we have to love our neighbor? You know, it's like what I, I don't. Where's that even coming from? You know, the first one, the legal question, I could understand. You know, you have scriptural precedent for that kind of wrestling with God's law and the, you know, Babylon's law and when the exiles violate Babylon's law or whatever. Um, can, can we go there, actually? I mean, either one of you. I mean, uh, I mean see, I'd wait, say that, yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. I, just, I mean, they're, they're human questions, right? They're questions that the people of God, the human people of God ask, and you can track God responding to them all throughout scripture, Old and New Testament. I mean, John was mentioning about, you know, Jesus loved these questions about resources mm-hmm. and Jesus loved these questions about, you know, are we going to have to change? Uh, we mm-hmm. see that all through the Old Testament too. I mean, one of the, one of the themes I ask my students to track when I teach, um, I teach a class on the prophets and their writings and we track, you know, what is this book? What is this prophet? What is this whatever story teaching us about what it means to be the people of God? And it's always coming in times of change, right? When change or when um, or when resources are short and so you're trying to figure out all these things. I mean, I, I'd say maybe they're not Christian questions, ideally, but they are very human questions. No, that's good. That's good. And I guess it depends on if the questions are more combative or if they're genuine. Que- if they're genuine questions, then I, I feel like I'm like, oh, I totally get it. Those are great questions. But sometimes Christians ask questions that are more like confrontive or like they're kind of mm-hmm. betraying a certain committed worldview already. Um, and that's that's where it's. I get it, though. I, was, I mean, I was raised in that kind of context, and that way of thinking. So I, I understand the logic of it all. But it, it does seem to rely on national American values more than Christian values uh, and not recognize some of the conflict there. Um, when you see asylum seeker, can you explain the difference between, for those who don't know, an asylum seeker and an undocumented immigrant or what some people might call a legal alien or whatever? Um, yeah. How yeah, are those- I, it's a, it's a spectrum. Uh, on one end of the spectrum are people who are trafficking humans and trafficking drugs. Um, they are really scary. I've talked to a lot of them and they are, horrifying um and they um have threatened children's lives for money and they then they have acted out they are truly horrifying people there's not very many of them there's thousands of them but they're they are they are one end of the spectrum on the other far end of the spectrum are refugees and they have been recognized by the government given support by the government uh, welcomed by the government if you help refugees you are given support by the government financial support Hmm. they're the other end of the spectrum also down at that end of the spectrum are people with green cards um, and uh, people with, uh, you know, have been granted citizenship. Um, in the middle of the spectrum is the law, this big black line. It moves around a little bit, but this big black line. If you're on one side, you're here legally. If you're on the other side, you're here illegally. And there are millions of people who are here without documents. They're on the wrong side of the law, but they are doing everything they possibly can to follow the law. They're they're paying for car insurance. They're following the speed limit. They're paying their rent and their taxes and all that. They're doing everything that law they possibly can follow. They're following. Um, and they are not benefiting at all from being here without documents. In fact, it's it's a huge burden uh, on them. But there's no law for them to follow to get over that line, uh, that legal line. Okay. There's no possible way for them to do that. Now, asylum seekers are different. They have come here fleeing. It's legal to ask for asylum. Uh, So they have come here to our country and they have crossed the river and immediately asked the Border Patrol for asylum. And then they're given paperwork that says you are here legally. Uh, You have permission to be here legally as you pursue your asylum case. But it's this weird gray zone where even though you're here legally, you cannot rent you cannot drive. You can't legally open a bank account. Huh. Uh, you can't uh, legally work. You can't do anything except be here uh, while you uh, work out your asylum case. So that puts people completely dependent on their sponsors. Uh, it puts single women in horrifically vulnerable places uh, and children uh, and families in really, really difficult places. And so then it's very easy, that spectrum, that immigration spectrum is on a slant. It's really easy for them to slide down onto the other side of the law. And it's really, really difficult for them to progress okay. up the spectrum to being here legally. You have to have minimum 
$5,000 to pay a lawyer and probably seven months to argue your legal case, all the while you're not legally allowed to work or rent or do any of these these things. So our church finds our place work, working with the, this vulnerable population, the asylum seekers. They're here legally, but they're in this strange gray zone where they have no support. No one is given support uh, to help them. We get no reimbursement at all for any of the support we give. And in fact, there are a lot of barriers uh, put up. Sometimes they're given GPS monitors on their ankle. They're told to check in with ICE a certain number of times, and they're uh, given all, all number of threats uh, that they'll be they'll be deported if they do anything uh, whatsoever wrong. What, so if somebody's an undocumented immigrant and not an asylum seeker, why is it? Why can't they just be an asylum seeker, and therefore have some level yeah. of legal covering? Um, that- it's really, really hard to become an asylum seeker. Okay. Uh, you have to ask for asylum, and then you are interviewed. And it's about a three-hour interview uh, where a an ICE officer uh, will, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, will interview you and say, it, do you have a credible fear of returning to your country? Okay. And the percentage of people who pass that credible fear interview are is not very high. Okay. Um, they have to demonstrate, yes, if I go back to my country, I will die. Um, and if they cannot demonstrate that, then they're deported almost immediately. Okay. Uh, so all the asylum seekers that we generally have have some sort of credible fear that has been demonstrated, um, wow. uh, which is which is difficult to do. And then they're going to have to provide evidence for all of that before mm-hmm. a judge, hmm. um, if they're going to progress in their in their uh, asylum case. And what we're t- we're talking about um, we're talking about. Um, uh, parents who are saving their children's lives. I mean, yesterday we received a family, uh, their little girl's dying of cancer, and they were constantly under threat and being extorted for every extra dollar. They're business owners. They're cheese makers. And they are making cheese in their little town. And every time they had any extra money was taken by the street gangs uh, as a quote-unquote tax. And so they knew their child is dying. They know little precious Emma is, is, is dying of this cancer and they have no way to provide for her. So imagine, imagine that holding your little girl every night uh, as a dad uh, and you want to, um, you want to bring her to safety. You're going to, you're going to step across borders uh, mm-hmm. to get her there. And there's no, there's nothing that will prevent you from doing that. In the same way a dad is going to pick up his child and run from floodwaters to the highest house in the neighborhood. Even if that house has a fence around it, you're going to get there. Uh, and you're going to do everything you can to get your, your little girl uh, to the other side yeah. of that that fence. Um, and so th- these are these are the brothers and sisters um, that we're receiving. Another mama, uh, she she came here. Her little boy uh, fell off one of the the trains. She didn't have any money to get here, but her her little boy was being pushed into the gangs. They were forcing him to join the gang. And so she took him in the night, and they walked. Uh, they walked through the jungle. They crossed the Guatemalan border. They hitched rides. They got to Mexico. They got on the on the freight trains coming north without any resources. Little boy fell off and he lost his leg under the train. Um, miraculously survived. She got him here by the grace of God, uh, by the grace of God, holding this little boy uh, missing his leg and saying, um, "I want asylum. It might my, my little boy. I, I'm going to do whatever it takes." Mm-hmm. to save my little boy from the gangs and to save my little boy's uh my little boy's uh, life to call her criminal and and she was she's charged with a misdemeanor it's similar as like speeding in a school zone i think crossing the border illegally we charge her with a misdemeanor and we call her criminal mm-hmm. um and, and we lock her up she spent time in jail um and her little boy was locked up as well um to call her criminal doesn't that make us criminal um, in some way, and for the church to say to turn a blind eye to that, um, yeah. I, I think it's damning to us. Um, but it's also transformative, uh, transformative for our community to say, "Here's a bed, um, and here here are some meals for you. Here's a place for you to heal. Let's let's pray together." Rebecca, help us to think through this theologically. I mean, you're you're hearing these stories from John. I'm sure you got a lot more that you've in, engaged with. Um, uh, how, you know, a Christian hearing this, what, what should be the Christian theological response to some of these tensions as you've thought through this? I mean, love, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the first and greatest commandment. Um, and I think, I mean, it, it's, that's the call, right? Love that is self-sacrificing. 
um, love that is hard, love that makes no sense um, to our communities, to our government. I think that's that's mm-hmm. the most simple answer. Um, one of the things that that I've really, I mean, this is some of what John and I have been trying to do together is thinking about how, um, you know, reading the Psalms together. So he hasn't talked about this yet, I don't think, but but reading the Psalms together is a huge part of what he's been doing mm. um, with his church and with um, their guests. And um, when I read the Psalms with my students here, right, or with the churches that I teach in or preach in or wh- wherever, um, I think the language of the Psalms and the stories that the Psalms tell and the the anger and the cursing that the Psalms mm. articulate. I mean, I see that as an invitation to, to tremendous empathy um, and tremendous compassion, um, recognizing that um, the, these were these are our brothers and sisters, the ones that voiced these psalms 2,000, 3,000 years ago, um, and the ones border um, of this country and the border borders around the world. Mm-hmm. So I think love and then figuring out how to do that in practice, right? Because we're supposed mm-hmm. to we're supposed to act and not just say, "Oh, that's so sad." It, right. it is the psalms make less sense or maybe have less of a impact when when you for lack of better terms are reading it from a position of privilege and power or lack of trauma or you're not going through stuff that John's talking about have you how have you grown even spiritually watching people encounter the psalms after having gone through some of the stuff they've done has that been pretty I don't know, encouraging and impacting, convicting, or um, have you seen it work? I mean, I hate that. I, I'm trying to avoid that kind of language, but ha- in integrating, engaging the Psalms with some some level of trauma therapy, have you seen it have a positive impact on people's lives? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll maybe I'll start out sort of where I started thinking about this, and then I'll pitch it to John because he's actually um, been implementing some of this in some really amazing ways, but. I mean, so so broad strokes of of trauma healing, right? Um, you've got to start dealing with with those who have been traumatized um, by helping them to feel safe, right? Like physically, mentally, biologically, you cannot deal with hmm. what is going on if you are still under threat, mm-hmm. right? Like you have to, you have to be able to calm your breathing down. You have to be able to bring your heart rate down. You have to be able to feel like you're not going to get killed in this moment. Right. Right. And so you have to establish some kind of place of, of safety and security and trust with the person or people that you're with. Um, And I think think we definitely see the Psalms doing, but then you have what's going on, right? You have to acknowledge, you have to mourn, you have to get angry and to, to voice that hurt. Um, And we certainly see the Psalms doing that and giving language um, to us when we don't have it ourselves. And I think this is really important, even in some of the Psalms that are really, really challenging for us to read, you know, those, those imprecations, those curses, that be the ones who are little babies on the rocks, right? Yeah. I mean, that's really harsh. What do we do with that as Christians? Um, yeah. But if you're reading, if you're reading it with, with this experience in mind, it, it sort of changes how you see it. Um, huh. And so you've got to acknowledge a name and mourn and grieve and, and do all of that. And you don't do it all at once, right? It's this, but then you have to figure out how to re- begin to live again. Um, and seeing um, that's that transformation that John's talking about, right? Transforming the trauma um, of the cross, mm-hmm. the trauma of death, um, the trauma of suffering and separation. Um, to community into relationship um and so you see all of those things happening in the psalms mm-hmm. um over and over and over again in lots of different ways which is fitting because yeah. people are different our situations are all different what would you say i mean as you're talking it sounds like I, i'm not an expert in this at all but like the the path to healing from trauma like we there's a lot of psychological work that's done on you know the steps of grieving and how you can best heal from trauma it sounds like what you're saying is and i don't want to 
be too anachronistic or make the Psalms out to be more modern than they are. But it sounds like the Psalms are kind of doing a lot of what we now know through modern psychology is a healthy way to heal. Is that, would that be an accurate way of saying it? I mean, you have all these different emotions, lament and anger and, and safety and God's presence and all these things that the same categories that you're kind of talking about. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I would say that certainly as a pastor, I would say that Um, as a, as a biblical scholar writing for SBL and things like that, you have to use certain nuance and come at it different ways. But I mean, I would absolutely say that. Yeah. Um, for either of you, Oh, I was going to transition to the undocumented immigrant. Um, what is the Christian response? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Rebecca. I was going to say, before you do that, I don't yeah. know, John John has has applied some of these songs yeah, yeah. To, with the asylum seekers that he's worked with in some really important ways that have taught me a lot. So I didn't know, John, if you want to share some of that. Yeah, I, mean, I would just reiterate, pastorally, I mean, the Psalms are extremely powerful communal trauma. Um, it is is a the creation of a safe place and temple place for the healing of an entire community that's been traumatized. Wow. And it's it's I mean, we have to pray them every single day as a church. We get up every morning early and we pray the Psalms. We pray for one another. Um, and it's absolutely critical for dealing with traumatized uh, victims, trauma survivors and dealing with secondary trauma. Mm-hmm. Um and and part what one of that that really important thing is like the Psalms do this thing called what now psychologists they have a name for it they call it um, titrated pendulation, huh. where you give someone a place of safety, and then you introduce them to their really strong emotions, and then you swing them back to the place of safety, and you titrated and very very specifically swing them back into their huge emotions, and then swing them back into. Uh, there, this experience of felt safety, and that's where you have this transformation of trauma. And you just see this this pattern is all over the Psalms if you read them straight wow. through as they're originally organized. Um, and y- y- and we we have to have that. We have to have a guide. You know, you you sit in a group. You need somebody to say, "Let's be vulnerable," and then model that vulnerability. Huh. Um, you need someone to model the safety and model the vulnerability. And the Psalms do that. If you say, "All right, let's pray." Uh, and and then you get into some of these psalms that are furious um, and hateful and saying, God, take this rage. I want you to take this rage I have. You have to uh, admit that you have rage. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this is so, so common in trauma victims. They're unable to give voice to that. Uh, we see this all the time. A young woman who lived with us for a long time, she was a victim of, of multiple rapes and, and sexual abuse. And she would just say, straight face, like, así es la vida. Like, this is what life is. This is mm-hmm. what life is like. But then she's watching a Disney movie and bawling her eyes out, mm-hmm. just like weeping at the slightest little uh, set. She needs to give, she needs someone to give her permission to say, I am furious at my abuser. I'm furious at mm-hmm. my rapist. Mm-hmm. I want God. I want you to do this, 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 and this mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. this person who hurt me and took my childhood and took my life and took my brother. Um, I want you to do all these things. And the Psalms give us permission mm-hmm. to say that and to do that in rage. But then, but then they swing us back. Mm-hmm. Uh, they swing mm-hmm. us back with this this um, this pendulation back into that place of safety. So Dr. Pohays was mentioning that Psalm 137, like dashing your your yeah. babies on the rock, like that's a real emotion, like this violent, raging emotion um, that says, I, "You did this to us, God. I want you to do this to them. I want mm-hmm. you to make them suffer." But Psalm 137, we don't get there. Psalm 136, and it is this mantra psalm, and it's the mantra where 26 times we have the line repeated, uh, your hesed love forever, Hmm. your love forever. You know, uh, Leolam Hasdau, or however you pronounce the Hebrew, it's like (laughs) 26 times this like mantra of like your love forever, your love forever. And then out of that place of safety is about our rage. Let's talk about how we sometimes can't speak and we can't sing and we're going to have to hang up our harps and we are being mocked and our hands don't work and our voice 
we have no home and we've lost everything. And you know what I want to do, God? I want to kill somebody. I want to destroy life. Hmm. And then the next Psalm, Psalm, you know, 138 swings us back into an answer word for word. Hmm. Those emotions. Um, like uh, it's a, it, it provides an image of home, an image of singing with that broken heart and that broken uh, tongue. Uh, and, and then most powerfully, it has this in never letting go mm. of the beauty of creation. Mm. Uh, so he's like, I want you to fling this baby. And God in Psalm 138 will never let go uh, of that child. And then, then we're in Psalm 138. There's not a single place you can go uh, to, to flee from my spirit. Um, I knit you together in your mama's womb. Um, and I, I know all the, the hairs on your head and then it ends your Hesed love forever. You know, Uh, let, let, let's go back into that mantra and the Psalms provide us that tool, like doing that as a group hmm. of broken hearted, furious, completely disempowered, hopeless, uh, folks to find that safety, to release our rage into God's hands, to hear God's voice. Um, in response, I think is it, it's so um, church, you know, wow. like that is what we're called to be as the as the body of Christ. And then we're praying that along with the enslaved folks in Babylon. Mm. And we're praying that along with Jesus, um, mm. his prayer book. And then we're praying it along with all of our brothers and sisters over these last generations. And then right now that we don't even know we haven't even met them yet. So the sense of community and relationship is really powerful reading. I think that's one of the things over the past few years that has been, you talk, you asked Preston about what's been spiritually formative. I mean, that's been one of the biggest things is just um, realizing that I am not alone. Mm -hmm. Right. And when I read the Psalms, when I pray the Psalms, I'm praying them with a whole world and eternity of of brothers and sisters, including the incarnate Christ, um, mm. who prayed these, even the really angry Psalms, the Psalms yeah. that curse. Um, and it, that's made the incarnation really powerful for me. So the, 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 you, you guys are both saying that like the imprecatory Psalms, because I've often been troubled by those, you know, and, and especially I'm, I'm an advocate for nonviolence. I have Mennonite uh, <laughs> leanings, John, I'd, I'd fit within your tradition. Well, even though I wasn't raised that way, but I, uh, yeah, you read the Psalms. I'm like, Oh, like, I think even Lewis, C.S. Lewis, you know, has a whole chapter talking about how he's really troubled, disturbed by these images. But that, so what you're saying is these cry out to God to dash their children against the rocks are just, are more capturing the the righteous indignation over evil and oppression. It's more that than it is reflecting like God's ethical heart or whatever, or, or even necessarily what the person is going to act on. It's just, it's an expression right. of what's going on deep down. And these are the only images and words that can capture the deep rooted pain and oppression that I've gone through. Is that, would that be a good way of explaining right. it? Remember, I mean, this is back to that. You've got to read scripture, not from a position of privilege and power, right? right. Like these are the voices of people that are exiled. These are the voices of refugees and asylum seekers and enslaved mm. peoples. Um, they can't go and dash anybody against the rocks, but they certainly wish they could. Um, and that's a real emotion. And actually, you know, talk about nonviolence. Is it, I think Miroslav Volf talks about to have a nonviolent, to have a pacifist theology, um, you have to have a really robust understanding of a God of justice yeah. that you can give over Mm-hmm. those feelings too. And I think that's what you see here. Hmm. And that's yeah. the critical thing because it, we, how dare we pretend we're not angry and right. how dare we pretend <laughs> we don't experience hatred. I love Eugene Peterson in his book, wonderful book on the Psalms. Uh, he points out that hatred is our experience of evil. And if we pretend that we're not, that we can deal with that alone, then we're going to be in serious trouble. I mean, that's my understanding mm-hmm. of what he's saying. And so we have to hand that over. There's no, there's nowhere in the Psalms that I've found where it says, I am going to do this. Right. I'm going to kill and suffer and make you suffer. It's more like, God, you do this. Um, and so mm-hmm. you're, it is this release of that anger and that, and I, I'll tell you what, I do that when I'm in a really rough place. And I'm furious at our immigration policy, and I'm going to have to go sit in an office 
waiting for some official to make a pronouncement about a family that I love, I'm going to go and pray and I'm going to pray Psalm 10 through 18 and I'm going to straight through and I'm going to give all of that. I'm not going to pretend yeah. that I can handle that on my own as a pacifist. Huh. Um, I'm going to uh, re- release that. And then and then the problem with giving stuff over to God is then you have to re- listen for the response. Yeah. <laughs> and you can say you can then let God say, OK, thank you for that. This is how I'm going to transform it. Um, and this is going to be uh, yeah. the, this next uh, this next step. But how how dare we try and keep it right, that hatred right. and that anger on our hearts? Well, because if we um, do, then it will manifest in actual violence or lashing out or anger. But if you have a communal in the communal piece, I keep coming back to in my mind. Just you guys keep emphasizing that that if communally traumatized people are releasing this kind of anger directing it towards God, I can I can just imagine the power that that is uh, for healing. That community piece, I mean, we've seen that's one of the biggest um, predictors or I don't know what the right word is, but um, people who are resilient, who are able to handle all of the horrible things that life throws at us Mm -hmm. um, are people that have community, that have relationship, that have secure Mm -hmm. attachment. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the reasons that that this pandemic has been so devastating on so many people is because it is forced us to isolate right and that's just that's that's destructive and so again that's a that's somewhere i turn to during the pandemic right is the psalms because i could pray them and not be alone right um and that that really um really embracing that community and that relationship um, with other people with god um that's really key Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that's great um I want to try to get in the minds of some my audience and, and the questions they might have. And, and one has to do with undocumented immigrants, AKA illegal aliens, as some people call them. Um, and I, yeah, I just, just so people make sure they know where I'm at. I mean, I, I, every Christian would say we're supposed to obey the state unless the state is telling you to do something that goes against your Christian values. To me, Um, loving your undocumented neighbor in need, as you said, is a Christian value that trumps um, what Babylon is saying is legal or illegal. So um, that's, that's where I'm at. I I would say I have like King, you know, used to say that we have a moral obligation to break unjust laws um, or, you know, we have a moral obligation to live out a Christian faith, even if it conflicts with the laws of Babylon. Um, But what, like, what do you say, how do you process for either of you, you know, uh, undocumented immigrant, you know, they, why don't they go through the legal means of, of getting citizenship? Or even I've heard from some people who have gone through the process of getting legal citizenship, gotten their green, green card, that even some people who have gone through that are the ones who are um, most discouraged about uh, undocumented immigrants because they're doing it the easy way or whatever. Um, uh, what do you say? I mean, does this, uh, John, does this come up in your church context um, where people raise questions about whether we should be doing this? And is this really following Jesus or are we disobeying the state? And is Jesus displeased at what we're doing? Or how have you wrestled with that? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, I would say, first off, we worked really closely with the state, actually. Um, I get called by ICE I, I agents all the time saying, hey, will you take this family? Uh, out of the um, out of this detention center um, okay. because they, they need to go out and they don't have anywhere. Um, we'll get, I get calls from Border Patrol. Um, we work really closely. I was in the military hospital the other day where they had medevaced out someone from a drowning. Uh, she lost her child in the river. Um, and and the the um, so we work really closely and we don't want to endanger that by being felons. Okay. Um, and so we have to be really careful. Some churches really embrace the sanctuary movement where they'll pick one family and do sort of really intentional um, disobeying of the law, which they see as unjust. We have to be careful with that because, I mean, we're, we're working hand in hand with officials who are working, um, you know, against human traffickers um, and 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 trying to, to keep family. I mean, they're saving lives um, in a lot of instances. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there there is this uh, there's this reality that first and foremost, I'm a Christian. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm 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 obeying laws that are a lot older than the 300 year old <laughs> country that we live in here with these borders that have been shifted so many times. 
Um, and and I think you know that there is the you know oftentimes my 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 little girl, my little middle school daughter is like, so dad, are you a felon? Is that really the case? Uh, and and you know you have to be very gentle with the with the answer there yeah. because it's a question of fear. Um, are we in danger? Um, and that is a really powerful question for children. It's a really powerful question for anybody. It was a powerful question for the disciples when they saw that leper walking toward Jesus. Like he will, if we do anything with him, we will be unclean. We will be leprous. We will be felonous. You know, we will be unclean. And and that is that is how the trajectory works. The unclean one makes all of us unclean. And Jesus completely reverses this in Mark chapter one. And he reaches out and touches Uh first the unclean one. And that that trajectory is completely flipped around. And Jesus's love transforms uh, and also the leper's desire transforms and and faith. It transforms that uncleanliness. And if I'm going to be so bold as to call myself a Christian, if I'm going to be that audacious, then I ought to be able to uh, temper that fear um, and and uh, of like, will I become unclean uh, because of this calling of love? Um, and I, I don't want to pretend like I'm not afraid of that. I'm not mm-hmm. a, a pretend like I'm not afraid every time I get a call. Uh, from a government official, um, and 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 so we turn that into prayer. Um, mm. Dear Lord, you know, I'm afraid. I, I would like you to change all the laws of this country. Mm. I would like you to rip down every prison and every border. I would like you to make us all one, bring us all together at the table, mm. and all the people who are being mean and saying horrific <laughs> things about my brothers and sisters, the ones that I adore, um, my, my, my friends, uh, these children that I've, I've taught in school as when I was a, a middle school science teacher, how, how, you know, I want to, I want to do that imprecation, that curse, God, I want you to transform their hearts of stone, uh, mm-hmm. so they can see their brothers and sisters beyond, uh, this, um, uh, you know, bizarre lie, mm-hmm. um, that is perpetuating systems of power, yeah. uh, and, wealth and and xenophobia and and all that yeah yeah that's good i i mean i could i could see i mean it's it's so what's the solution and this is where we dabble into kind of secular politics which i don't think christians have i don't think that's our calling really but i I mean a country has borders and citizenship and i don't know a single country we can just wander in without any kind of you know like i was you know, you guys travel, I'm sure you travel the world. There's no, I've never been to a country where I can just walk on by without showing my passport, my visa three months. And now you got to get a two COVID tests with it. Like it's countries have rules and regulations. There's no such thing as just no, you know, uh, borders or whatever. So I can see the logic of that. And yet as a Christian, like you said, my duty is not to, I don't know. It, my duty is to live out my Christian faith in the, in the Babylonian context. I am not to tell Babylon, here's how you should run your secular vision of the kingdom on earth. It's always going to be a shadow and a charade. But in that in that regard, I, mean, I think it's very important for us, certainly as Anabaptists, but it's really important for us to have that se- se- separation of church and state. Yeah. It is not our job to create the policies. It is our job though, to speak truth about who these policies are about. Hmm. It yeah, is our job yeah. to tell true yeah. stories about who these laws affect. Um, and what we need to do as Christians is not just tell truth, but we need to also model good behavior. So yeah. I often get, oh, so you want to take care of all these people? And I'll say, well, these are the people who are in my house right now. <laughs> and like We need to be able to model that good right. behavior. We tell true stories. And we model good behavior and we tell true stories and we model good behavior. And, you know, we I, we just have to be like Philip. You know, you have the first, you know, um, racist comment in the New Testament uh, is directed to Jesus. And it's the first chapter, of John, like nothing good comes from that place. <laughs> nothing good will come from people, those people and that place. And Philip's response is not um, a political argument. He does not give a. A, um, an academic argument. He just says, "Come and see." Come and see. Um, and and, I, and and so it's just like I, I want you to I want you to figure out the identity of Messiah uh, by walking 
uh, let's do some action and let's do some listening. Um, so and I think that's what the church needs to do in this particular context with immigration. We don't need to pres- prescribe policies, but we need to talk about who the policies are about. Mm. And we need to tell true stories about our brothers and sisters. And we need to model good behavior um, in the use of our, uh, you know, the, the, the giving over of our resources into God's hands so that we can see some multiplication mm. um, and see this, this feast of life. Mm. Would you say it's almost distracting when Christians try to pick some political side, you know, like build a wall or don't build a wall or, you know, these people are destroying our country or economics or they're, I don't know, I guess just the, 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 the secular partisan way of framing the whole conversation. It seems like that could be a dis- on both sides, really, a, a real distraction from the kingdom focus that Christians should have. It's idolatry is what it is. It's it's a it's a system of idolatry. Idolatry in the old uh, in the uh, Hebrew Bible is always linked to the mistreatment of the foreigner, mm-hmm. the orphan, wow, yeah. and the widow. Wow. Yeah. There's always there's always a link to that that idolatry and and uh, injustice yeah. of the of the poor and and the hungry. Um, and so idolatry though is always an invitation to the church to to share good news. Um, and to share stories about the kingdom of God, um, and it's just it's just important to to say, oh yeah, that's idolatrous. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> I like your images. Yeah. Very yeah. nice design. It's good idolatry. It's well done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a beautiful idol you got there. Very attractive. Nice gold. Yeah. <laughs> Spoken like a good Mennonite. Um, <laughs> Uh, Rebecca, it, it, we're going to round things out here. Uh, any, you've been listening to me and John banter back and forth for a bit. Any, any kind of final words or reflection or encouragement or challenge to, uh, to Christians listening? I would just encourage y'all to go and read the Psalms, not just the Psalms, but the Psalms are a good place, a nice accessible place to start, but read them with um, somebody that is really different than you. Somebody that has a really different location, a really different past, um, a really different perspective. Um, and when you, and, and just really hear how they are hearing scripture and experiencing God working through that. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, so many of us have had really cushy lives as Christians. Mm -hmm. Um, and we don't really understand why, um, you know, Psalm 137 ends the way it does, or why one Psalm 69 has that whole list of curses and ends mm-hmm. essentially saying, you know, pardon the language, but it's, it's the mm-hmm. it's what it's saying that, you know, God damn these enemies mm-hmm. to hell, these people that have mistreated me. You know, we we have a hard time understanding that, um, and we want to condemn it or we want to separate from it and say like, oh, well, this is Old Testament, or oh, only Jesus could, you know, can do this. Um, and I just invite. I invite people, including myself, you know, to keep reading those. And and when you hit those things that make you uncomfortable or that make you, um, yeah, that make you uncomfortable, take it as an opportunity to learn and to listen and to think about the people in the world um, that feel that, um, to pray for those people, Um, not as a, oh, God, please help them not feel that way, you know, not be angry, but God, please help their situation and help me know how to help their situation. Um, anyway, that's sort of rambling, but I mean, yeah. just listen. And, and actually who, I, don't, I can't remember who it is, John. I don't know if you remember, but there's somebody, is it Ellen Davis or Walter Brueggemann or somebody talks about those, those Psalms of imprecation, those curses, um, as an opportunity for us to, to self examine and see, mm-hmm. is there anybody in the world that can be pray, that might be praying this about me? Oh, wow. Um, and I think in America right now, that's something we can all, can all question. So wow. read, read the Bible and hear the Bible and read the Bible with other people. That's a good word. Good word to end on. Thank you guys so much for being part of uh, the podcast, giving us a ton to think about and a lot to feel, uh, about, uh, where, where can people find both of you and, and maybe your work or websites or books or, um, that people want to read up more? Um, I, I'm not very good at the internet. I should be better at the internet, but, uh, we have Facebook, uh, San Antonio Mennonite church, and we have a website, San Antonio Mennonite.org. Awesome. Um, and I think we, uh, I think we did something on, on Instagram last year. Okay. <laughs> there's a, 
And and you did a Christianity Today article oh. a couple years ago, right? That's really good. What's the title uh-huh. of that? Mm-hmm. Um, I think they, it's fleeing north in the full armor of God. I think you know how magazines they title it themselves. That's right. They yeah. always come up with their own titles. I will. Uh, I'll try to put a link in that uh, to that article mm-hmm. in the show notes. Um, and, and Rebecca, you got. I know you. You're. I'm looking I, right now yeah, at I your web page for uh, Truett Seminary. Yeah, Do you have another yeah, website but, or anything? No, I'm not good at internet either. Um, <laughs> but I think my email address is on my faculty page, and so you're welcome to. Oh my gosh! Email me. It is. You list your um, email publicly. That's. I know. That's you know. So I invite. I invite emails. <laughs> 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 There's books and articles, so. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm looking at your uh, CV here. Um, that's awesome. Well, cool. Thank you so much, you guys, for being on Theology and Raw. And, uh, yeah, keep up the great work. Seriously, it's uh, – uh, if I remember down – I'll be in Dallas uh, in October. Um, I was in San Antonio, gosh, um, a couple of years ago. I wish we had connected before. That would have been fun to check out your church. But, uh, yeah, thanks so much for your faithfulness and your – Willingness to say unpopular things and do unpopular things in the kingdom of God. Yes, thank you for having us. It was an honor to talk to you. Cool. Take care.